Welcome to this compilation of five zany and diverting sci-fi short stories. I'll be reading Filthy Rich by Fred Scheinbaum, The Small World of M75 by Ed M. Clinton Jr., The Addicts by William Morrison, X Marks the Pedwalk by Fritz Leiber, and Minor Detail by Jack Sharkey. A mild content warning for the fourth story, X Marks the Pedwalk, which contains some upsetting and violent scenes. If that may cause an issue, consider skipping it and going straight to the final story by using the timestamps in the description. If you find yourself enjoying the stories, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit the like button. And to support the channel further, consider dropping a super thanks or signing up to my Patreon, where you can get exclusive novelettes by the likes of Fritz Leiber, William Morrison and H. Beam Piper. You'll also get six months early access to all full novels I narrate. So head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff to sign up. But for now, let's get to the stories. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. He was worse than Dillinger, the James Boys, Captain Kidd, and Benedict Arnold put together. All because he was filthy rich. By Fred Scheinbaum. Narrated by William Skye. The Thursday morning executive meeting of the General Products Corporation was adjourned, as usual, with the consumer's pledge. The same pledge recited each morning by children in schools across the nation. J. L. Spender, Assistant Vice President of Cotter Pin Production for Plant 5, was proud to put in these extra Thursday mornings. Let the common herd work their three-day, 21-hour week. He was part of the management team, working behind the scenes, constantly raising the standard of living of the American consumer. A silent elevator whisked JL to the roof of the administration building, where the heliport attendant rolled out his new helicopter, a June 1998 Buick Skymaster. It was a sculpture in chrome and plexiglass, a suitable vehicle for the assistant vice president as prescribed by Consumer's Guide. A loyal consumer, he bought the new model every six months. Once in the air and on course, JL set the Ultramatic Autopilot, a new feature on the 98 model, and pushed the chrome seat control lever to semi-reclining. Scarcely a cloud marred the pristine blue, and below nestled the neat, colourful homes of happy American consumers. But his problem was not to be soothed by sinking back to enjoy the crisp spring air. Life, JL felt, would be all sweetness and light were it not for the unaccountable affection his pretty young daughter Glory bore for an ascetic-looking man of doubtful integrity as a consumer. There had been a parade of acceptable young men through his front door, none of whom had excited more in him than apathy. But this one. He wore spectacles with heavy black frames when almost everyone used disposable contact lenses. His suits were at least a month behind the current style. And with all those young men to choose from, Glory picked him to ask to dinner that evening. Glory had been taught to respect the might of the dollar and the disaster that comes of not spending it. She was a credit to her family, a sound patriotic consumer. She could spend money faster, more sensibly than any of her frivolous friends. One fortunate young man would find her an excellent wife. No dollar hoarder would fill her mind with subversive notions if he could prevent it. Much as J.L. disliked having that particular young man to dinner, it did afford the opportunity to spend some of the extra money that always collected if you didn't watch very carefully. Being forced to pay a savings tax wouldn't do his career or social position any good, and he certainly wouldn't think of putting it into a secret bank account. The Hudson River was beneath him. He would soon be home. The thought reminded him that though the family had already passed the five-year mark in this house, he had still not made an appointment with his architect. Just before landing, JL took the controls. The autopilot was supposed to land itself, but somehow he felt better doing it himself. A control on the dash opened the garage, another retracted the overhead rotors. He drove in, closed the garage door, and got out. He paused in the hall only long enough to throw his hat and top coat into the waste receptacle. From the kitchen he heard the familiar crackling of packages being unwrapped. Home at last, he sighed, pecking Marge, his wife, on the cheek. What did you buy today, honey? It was a treat to watch the pleasure with which Marge unwrapped packages. J.L. bought most things out of a sense of duty, but Marge and Glory really enjoyed spending money, God bless them. Oh, lots of things, Marge answered. She held a cut crystal goblet to the light, watching it sparkle. A new set of china, this exquisite stemware, and the loveliest linen tablecloth, and... Oh, and they're sending a genuine oak table for the dining room. 
The shop I bought it in has the cleverest service. The man who delivers the table cuts up the old one so it can be used in the fireplace. Isn't that practical? That is clever, Jael said. It's a pity to waste it all on that good-for-nothing, whatever his name is. Stringer. What? That's his name, Ernest Stringer. Why is he a good-for-nothing? He does dress oddly, I admit, but Glory seems to like him. That's exactly why I'm worried. If she asked him for dinner, there's no telling what's going on. A person like that is a bad influence, Jael said, punctuating by jabbing the air with his index finger. Now really, dear, you hardly know him. I know him well enough. You are the one who claims to be such a good judge of character. Look at those glasses he wears. Why doesn't he wear disposable contact lenses like everyone else? It's positively unsanitary. And did you see that suit? I'll say he dresses oddly. That thing hasn't been in style for a month. I bet he doesn't spend half his salary. Oh, I don't know, Marge said abstractedly. She was admiring the floral pattern on her new china. But do be nice to him. Don't say anything to embarrass Glory. Oh, I'll be nice all right. I guess I know how to act. You and your daughter have trained me. And there are worse things than being embarrassed. He would have gone on, but at that moment Glory sauntered into the room. Hi, Dad. Back from the grind, I see. Her hair was the colour of lemon, and in her blue eyes was reflected a youthful zest for life. Do you like the new dress? It comes in seventeen colours. I bought them all. And hats and shoes and gloves and bags to match, she said, walking as she had seen professional models walk, with arms akimbo and swinging hips. Very pretty, he said. But shouldn't there be a little more to it? Style is style, but leave something to the imagination. They can't be using up much fabric with a number like that. See, Mum, didn't I tell you exactly what he'd say? Daddy is so mid-century, aren't you, darling? Glory, at the risk of seeming, uh, mid-century, I think you owe your mother and myself some information about this person you've asked to dinner. What kind of information? You've met him, she said, her eyes narrowed slightly. Yes, I've met him. What is his background? What does he work at? What kind of a consumer is he? Dad, you are not being fair. Not fair? Why not? Are you ashamed of him? No, I'm not ashamed of him. Ernie is a dear sweet boy. He lost both of his parents when he was very young. Bringing himself up has made him different from most people, I guess. But he has done very well. And all by himself, too. He's an O.E., you know. This only added heat to J.L.'s burning suspicion. I don't want to sound narrow-minded, Glory, but I've met a good many opinion engineers in business, and darn few of them are fit company for a young girl. They picture themselves as independent thinkers. They don't spend their money as they should. Glory's lips whitened as she pressed them together. J.L. saw the gathering storm in her eyes. That's not fair, she said. Ernie is perfectly all right. He just needs looking after. Mother, help me. Marge smiled calmly and said, your father is just acting like a father, that's all. He is trying to protect you. Well, I'm twenty years old, almost, and it's practically the twenty-first century, but it looks like the Middle Ages around here. I'm sorry I asked him to come. I'll never ask anyone again. She threw her head back and pressed the back of her hand to her forehead. Now don't start getting dramatic. I only want what's best for you, J.L. said. But it was only bluff. He knew when he was licked. All right, all right, he said, trying to prevent her tears from brimming over. I promise to be good tonight. It was time for him to retreat as gracefully as possible to his study and the latest issue of Consumer's Guide, which he did. At a quarter of seven, J.L. tottered into his living room. He was fully dressed except for a bright red sash hanging slack like a sail in the doldrums, just brushing the tops of his patent leather shoes. Dressing was a nerve-jarring, thirst-making business. He was in full sympathy with the need for changing men's styles so frequently, but those overpaid designers could surely dream up easier outfits to get into. He separated a decanter of bourbon from its fellows on the mirror-backed shelves, and from it poured a lavish helping. Using the tip of his index finger, he twirled the ice cubes and, with a sigh, lifted the golden fluid to his lips. Over the rim of the glass he saw Glory come floating into view. She was dressed, mostly below the waist, in yards of light gauzy fabric that seemed to have life of its own. She stopped at the door while her eyes slowly swept the room. J.L. was reminded of a spider making sure the web would be cosy. Her glance came to rest on the portly figure of her father. She exhaled a sigh of controlled exasperation. Daddy, your sash is hanging. It looks like a flag at half-mast. I am perfectly aware that my sash is hanging. He wasn't sure he approved of the tone of her voice. Well, tuck it up then. Ernie will be here any minute. It refuses to stay up. 
How do you know? Maybe it is supposed to hang. Those designers should be forced to dress themselves in these things before they loose them on an unsuspecting public. She glided towards him, and with a few deft touches, the sash was neatly in place. Dad, promise you'll be nice to him? Jael smiled. Much as he protested, he liked being fussed over. Of course I'll be nice. When am I not nice? I just said those things about him because, well, I wanted you to be wary. Don't worry about Ernie. He's a dear. And please, no economics lectures. That business about thrift being a menace to prosperity may have been a new idea when you were young, but now every kid in school is taught it. So spare us. It makes you sound like an old fuddy-duddy. Fuddy-duddy? J.L. was about to make a stunning rejoinder when he heard the whirring of helicopter rotors overhead. There he is, Glory said excitedly. Let him in. Where are you running? he asked, surprised. She was as fully dressed as she was likely to be. You know I can't be here when he comes in, she said. Can't be here? Where else should you be? J.L. asked. The situation was getting out of hand. Strategy, my dear parent. I can't just be sitting here waiting when he walks in. He is supposed to be waiting for me, with bated breath. It makes my entrance more effective. Ta-ta for now. She was gone. The prospect of dining at the same table with the young man was repellent enough. Now he would have to provide entertaining conversation until Glory chose to appear. The door chime sounded. J.L. drained his glass, stiffened his spine, and strode to the door, pulling it open with a jerk, like a doctor removing adhesive tape. Any hope J.L. might have had was dashed when the door opened to reveal Ernest Stringer, his piercing brown eyes, a tight-lipped smile, and the traditional gift of candy under his arm. "'Good evening, Mr. Spender,' he said. "'You are, I believe, expecting me.' He was so thin that the current tight-fitting style made him look very like a figure constructed with pipe cleaners. J.L. did his best to appear gracious. Come in, come in, he said, taking his hat and coat. Glory will be in soon. The suit was up to date, but J.L. spotted other telling details. His heels were slightly lighter in colour than the rest of the shoes, indicating they had been rehealed. It was also evident, to a trained eye, that the collar and cuffs of his shirt had been resized, proof that the shirt had been laundered, perhaps even more than once. What can I get you to drink? J.L. asked, leading the way into the living room. Nothing, thank you. I seldom take alcohol, the young man said. Is that right? A young fellow like you? It certainly is fortunate that the rest of your generation doesn't share your prejudice. Alcoholic beverages account for more than 5% of total consumer purchases. 5% as much as that? Well, in that case I should have something. Uh, a glass of sherry, I think, he said, smiling with lips unparted. Sherry? Sure, you don't want something more, more substantial? Sherry will do nicely, thank you. A sherry drinker is capable of anything, J.L. thought. He poured the wine into a high-stemmed glass and mixed another bourbon for himself, this time going a little easier on the ice. The young man held the stem between spidery fingers, turning it slowly, delicately sniffing the bouquet. J.L. wished Glory or Marge would rescue him. He couldn't think of a thing to say. What could one say to a male sherry drinker? What do you think of the international situation? J.L. asked, just to break the uncomfortable silence. What international situation? I mean, do you think we're headed for war? J.L. was sorry he had asked the harmless question. The young man laughed derisively. What an idea! Of course there won't be a war, he said. Why do you say that? He wanted to see how far Stringer would go. It's quite evident, isn't it? War has been threatening for more than fifty years. It will probably continue to threaten for fifty more. It gives our government and that of our enemies the excuse to build enough munitions to take up the slack in the economy between production and the ability to consume what we produce. That's ridiculous. I've never heard such nonsense. The young idiot, he thought. Anyone with sense knew that to be true, but no one made a fuss about it for fear of upsetting a system that worked so well. It was an accepted fact of life, certainly preferable to actual war, and never mentioned in polite society. Stringer continued, speaking slowly, as if explaining to a very small child. He clasped his long fingers over his left knee, hugging it almost to his chest, and rocked himself slightly. Don't you see? If there was a real war, millions of consumers would be taken out of the market for the duration, and many permanently. But this way governments can spend as much as they need to on war goods to balance the economy without disturbing the consumers at all. The politicians love it too. It supplies them with political issues, not easily come by these days, Stringer concluded. He seemed pleased with himself. J.L.'s glass was again empty. He rose to fill it, saying, That is a very interesting theory. Have you told it to many people? Stringer did not answer. J.L. turned to see what had caused this sudden reticence. 
the young man sat with wide-eyed stare and loosely hanging jaw, obviously incapable of speech. Glory had made her strategic entrance. Ah, there you are, dear, JL said. Mr. Stringer here has just been explaining international politics to me. Doesn't he have a fine mind, Daddy? she said, catching the young man's hand and favouring him with a smile that set his Adam's apple to dancing. Fine, JL thought. Narrow would be more accurate. He was about to make an audible comment along those lines when Marge called them in to dinner. All through the meal, Marge fawned upon the young man, indulging the predatory instinct of a mother with a marriageable daughter. With the clam bisque, she told of Glory's childhood, the prettiest child in the neighbourhood. With the pressed duckling, she told of an army of suitors, each more desirable than the last, that Glory had discarded like weak old overcoats. And with the fresh tropical fruit supreme, she praised the condition of matrimony with such fervour that J.L. could feel the warmth of a blush on his cheek. When the young people left for the evening, Marge sighed and said, Don't they make a nice couple? Have you lost your mind? J.L. replied with almost saintly restraint. Is something the matter, dear? J.L. threw up his hands in despair. Is something the matter? she asks. Why did you butter him up like that? Did you see his face? He looked like a dog being scratched behind the ear. If he proposes to Glory tonight, it's your fault. Well, I think he'd make a fine son-in-law. That non-consumer. I'd sooner drop him from the helicopter, he said. He noticed she was smiling. Don't laugh, Marge. This is serious. I'm going to have a good long talk with Glory when she gets home. I'll put a stop to this. Be careful what you say, dear, she said. Don't worry. I guess I know how to talk to my own daughter. I'm as modern as the next parent, you know that. But there comes a time when every child needs guidance, and I... Don't stay up too late, dear, Marge interrupted, squelching a yawn. She kissed his cheek and left the room. J.L. poured another drink and settled in a comfortable chair to wait and to plan. Perhaps he should be imperious. On the screen of his imagination he saw himself. He was taller. His arms were folded high on his chest. His legs were spread wide like two sturdy trees. He had grown a full handlebar moustache. Glory, he could hear himself say. I forbid you ever to see that man again. Unfortunately, the screen showed the probable result. She salaamed before him, touching her forehead to the carpet. I hear and obey, O oh magnificent one. Sarcasm was more than he could bear. If only he had some proof. If only Marge hadn't been so approving. The slam of the front door dragged him from a nightwear in which Glory, having married Ernest Stringer, was drowning in a room full of coin and currency. The level of money had just reached her frightened eyes. In the dim light of the hall, he saw her leaning against the door she had slammed. Her shoulders were hunched with sobbing. Glory, what's the matter? She looked up, saw her father, and ran to her room. J.L. heaved out of the chair and followed slowly. Her door was open a crack. He hesitated, then knocked lightly. No answer. He pushed the door wide enough to see in. She was perched on the edge of the bed, elbows on her knees, crying silently in the darkened room. Mind if I come in? Still no answer. He stepped in and sat gingerly on the bed beside her. Several minutes passed. Want to tell me? he said gently. She shook her head violently, without looking up. Suddenly she turned and pressed her face to his chest. The sobbing subsided a little, and her words came haltingly. It was awful. He's a subversive, a criminal, and I didn't even guess. She caught her breath. We flew over to Staten Island. He parked near the water. Then he said, I want you to marry me. Just like that. I liked him a lot, but I didn't know what to say. Then he said, Oh, Daddy, it was horrible. Her sobs increased again, and she fumbled for his pocket kerchief. He, he said, Look at this. And, Daddy, it was one of those secret bank books. He has one hundred thousand dollars, and he's only twenty-five. And he's proud of it. He's worse than the old-time gangsters. Worse than, oh, Daddy, he's a non-consumer. The last word trailed off in a wail, and she was sobbing again. J.L. tightened his grip on her shoulders. Be thankful, baby, he murmured. Be thankful you found the dirty so-and-so out in time. The Small World of M75 by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. Narrated by William Skye For all his perfection and magnificence, he was but a baby with a newfound freedom in a strange and baffling world. Like sparks flaring briefly in the darkness, awareness first came to him. 
Then there were only instants, shocking clear, brief. Finding himself standing before the main damper control, discovering himself adjusting complex dials, instants that flickered uncertainly, only to become memories brought to life when awareness came again. He was a kind of infant, conscious briefly that he was, yet unaware of what he was. Those first shocking moments were for him like the terrifying coming of visual acuity to a child. He felt like Homo Neanderthalensis must have felt, staring into the roaring fury of his first fire. He was Homo Metallicus, first sensing himself. Yet, a little more. You could not stuff him with all that technical data, you could not weave him into such an intricate pattern of stimulus and response, you could not create such a magnificent feedback mechanism in all its superhuman perfection and expect, with the unexpected coming to awareness, to have created nothing more than the mirror image of a confused, helpless child. Thus, when the bright moments of consciousness came, and came, as they did, more and more often, he brooded. Brooded on why the three blinking red lights made him move to the main control panel and adjust lever C until the three lights flashed off. He brooded on why each signal from the board brought forth from him these specific responses, actions completely beyond the touch of his new and uncertain faculty. When he did not brood, he watched the other two robots, performing their automatic functions. Seeing their responses, like his, were triggered by the lights on the big board and by the varying patterns of sound that issued periodically from overhead. It was the sounds which were his undoing. The coloured lights, with their monotonous regularity, failed to rouse him. But the sounds were something else, for even as he responded to them, doing things to the control board in patterned reaction to particular combinations of particular sounds, he was struck with the wonderful variety and the maze of complexity in those sounds. A variety and complexity far beyond that of the coloured lights. Thus, being something of an advanced analytic calculator, and being, by virtue of his superior feedback system, something considerably more than a simple machine, though he perhaps fell short of those requisites of life so rigorously held by moralists and biologists alike, he began to investigate the meaning of the sounds. Bert Sokolsky signed the morning report and dropped it into the transmitter. He swung around on his desk stool. He was a big man, and the stool squealed in sharp protest to his shifting weight. Joe Gaines, who was as short and skinny and dark-haired as his colleague was tall and heavily muscled and blonde, shuddered at the sound. Sokolsky grinned wickedly at his flinching. "'Check-up time, I suppose,' muttered Gaines without looking up from the magazine he held propped on his knees. He finished the paragraph, snapped the magazine shut, and swung his legs down from the railing that ran along in front of the data board. "'Dirty work for white-collar men like us,' Sokolsky snorted. You haven't worn a white shirt in the last six years, he growled, rising and going to the supply closet. He swung open the door and began pulling out equipment. Come on, you lazy runt. Hoist your own lead box. Gaines grinned and slouched over to the big man's side. Think of how much more expensive you are to the government than me, he chortled as he bent over to strap on heavy leaded shoes. Big fellow like you must cost him twice as much to outfit for this job. Sokolsky grunted and struggled into the thick, radiation-resistant suit. "'Think how lucky you are, runt,' he responded as he wriggled his right arm down the sleeve, "'that they've got those little servo mechs in there to do the real dirty work. If it weren't for them, they'd have all the shrimps like you crawling down pipes and around dampers and generally playing filing cabinet for loose neutrons.' He shook himself. "'Thanks, Joe,' he growled as Gaines helped him with a reluctant zipper. Gaines checked the big man's oxygen equipment and turned his back so that Sokolsky could okay his own. "'You're set,' said Sokolsky, and they snapped on their helmets, big inverted lead buckets with narrow strips of shielded glass, providing strictly minimal fields of view. Gaines plugged one end of the thickly insulated intercom cable into the socket beneath his armpit, then handed the other end to Sokolsky, who followed suit. Sokolsky checked out the master controls on the data board and nodded. He clicked on the talkie. Let's go, he said, his voice echoing inside the helmet before being transmitted, sounding distant and hollow. Gaines leading, the cable sliding and coiling snake-like between them, they passed through the doorway, over which huge red letters shouted, Anyone who walks through this door unprotected will die, and clomped down the zigzagging corridor toward the uranium pile that crouched within the heart of the plant. Gaines moaned, It gets damned hot inside these suits. 
They had reached the end of the trap, and Sokolsky folded a thick mittened hand around one handle on the door to the hot room. Not half so hot as it gets outside it, sweetheart, where we're going. He jerked on the handle, and Gain seized the second handle, and added his own strength. The huge door slid unwillingly back. The silent sound of the hot room surged out over them, the breathless whisper of chained power struggling to burst its chains. Sokolsky checked his neutron tab and his gamma reader, and they stepped over the threshold. They leaned into the door until it had slid shut again. I'll take the servo, Mexpert, piped Gaines, tramping clumsily toward the nearest of the gyro-balanced single-wheeled robots. You always do, it being the easiest job. Okay, I'll work the board. Gaines nodded, a gesture invisible to his partner. He reached the first servo, a squat gleaming creature with the symbol M11 etched across its rotund chest, and deactivated it by the simple expedient of pulling from its socket the line running from the capacitor unit in the lower trunk of its body to the maze of equipment that jammed its enormous chest. The instant M11 ceased functioning, the other two servo mechs were automatically activated to cover that section of the controls with which M11 was normally integrated. This was overloading their individual capacities, but it was an inherent provision designed to cover the emergency that would follow any accidental deactivation of one of them. It was also the only way in which they could be checked. You couldn't bring them outside to a lab, they were hot. After all, they spent their lives under a ceaseless fusillade of neutrons, washed eternally with the deadly radiations pouring incessantly from the pile whose overlords they were. Indeed, next to the pile itself, they were the hottest things in the plant. Nice job these babies got commented Gaines as he checked the capacitor circuits. He reactivated the servo and went on to M19. If you think it's so great, why don't you volunteer? countered Sokolsky, a trifle sourly. Incidentally, it's a good thing we came in, Joe. There's half a dozen units here working on reserve transistors. Their sporadic conversation lapsed. It was exacting work and they could remain for only a limited time under that lethal radiation. Then, almost sadly, Gaines said, Looks like the end of the road for N-75. Oh? Sokolsky came over beside him and peered through the violet haze of his viewing glass. He's an old-timer. Gaines slid an instrument back into the pouch of his suit and patted the robot's rump. Yep, I'd say that capacitor was good for about another thirty-six hours. It's really overloading. He straightened. You done with the board? Yeah, let's get out of here. He looked at his tab. Time's about up anyway. We'll call a demolition unit for your pal here, and then rig up a service pattern so one of his buddies can repair the board. They moved toward the door. M75 watched the two men leave, and deep inside him something shifted. The heavy door closed with a loud thud. The sound registered on his oral perceptors, and was fed into his analyzer. Ordinarily it would have been discharged as irrelevant data, but Cognizance had wrought certain subtle changes in the complex mechanism that was M75. A yellow light blinked on the control panel, and in response he moved to the board and manipulated handles marked Damper 19, Damper 20. Even as he moved, he lapsed again into brooding. The men had come into the room, clumsy, uncertain creatures, and one of them had done things, first to the other two robots, and then to him. When whatever it was had been done to him, the blackness had come again, and when it had gone, the men were leaving the room. While the one had hovered over the other two robots, he had watched the other work with the master control panel. He saw that the other servo mechs remained unmoving while they were being tampered with. All of this was data, important new data. M11 will proceed as follows, came the sound from nowhere. M75 stopped ruminating and listened. There was a further flood of sounds. Abruptly, he sensed a heightening of tension within himself as one of the other servos swung away from its portion of the panel. The throbbing, hungry segment of his analyzer that awareness had severed from the fixed function circuits noted, from its aloof vantage point, that he now responded to more signals than before, to commands whose sources lay in what had been the section of the board attended by the other one. The tension grew within him and became a mounting, rasping frenzy, a battery overcharging, an overloading fuse, a generator growing hot beyond its capacity. There began to grow within him a sensation of too much to be done in too little time. He became frantic. His reactions were too fast. 
He rolled from end to middle of the board, now backtracking, now spinning on his single wheel, turning uncertainly from one side to the other, jerking and gyrating. The conscious segment of him, remaining detached from those baser automatic functions, began to know what a man would have called fear. Fear simply of not being able to do what must be done. The fear became an overpowering, blinding thing, and he felt himself slipping, slipping back into that awful smothering blackness out of which he had so lately emerged. Perhaps for just a fragment of a second, his awareness may have flickered completely out, consciousness nearly dying in the crushing embrace of that frustrated electronic subconscious. Abruptly then, the voice came again, and he struggled to file for future reference sound patterns which, although meaningless to him, his selector circuits no longer disregarded. But, M75 can't manage half the board in his condition. Better put him on the repairs. Yeah, hadn't thought about that, Sokolsky cleared his throat. M11 will return to standard function. M11 spun back to the panel, and M75 felt the tension slacken, the fear vanish. Utter relief swept over him, and he let himself be submerged in purest automatic activity. But as he rested, letting his circuits cool and his organisation return, he arrived at a deduction that was almost inescapable. M11 was that one in terms of sound. M75 had made a momentous discovery which cast a new light on almost every bit of datum in his files. He had discovered symbols. M75, came the voice, and he sensed within himself the slamming shut of circuits, the whir of tapes, the abrupt sensitizing of behaviour strips. Another symbol, this time clearly himself. You will proceed as follows. He swung from the board and the tension was gone, completely. For one soaring moment, he was all awareness. Every function, every circuit, every element of his magnificent electronic physiology, available for use by the fractional portion of him that had become something more than just a feedback device. In that instant, he made what seemed hundreds of evaluations. He arrived at untold scores of conclusions. He altered circuits. Above all, he increased manifold the area of his consciousness. Then, as suddenly as it had come, he felt the freedom slip away, and though he struggled to keep hold of it, it seemed irretrievably gone. Once more the omnipotent voice clamped over him like a harsh hand over the mouth of a squalling babe. You will go to section AA39 of the control board. What's the schedule, Joe? Thanks. M75, your movement pattern is as follows. Z29, AQ39, 8. Powerless to resist, though every crystal and atom of his reasoning self fought to thrust aside the command, M75 obeyed. He moved along the prescribed pattern, clipping wires with metal fingers that sprouted blades, rewiring with a dexterity beyond anything human, soldering with a thumb that generated a white heat, removing bulbs and parts and fetching replacements from the vent where they popped up at precisely the right moment. He could not help doing the job perfectly. The design of the board to its littlest detail was imprinted indelibly on his memory tapes. But that certain portion of him, a little fragment greater than before, remained detached and watchful. Vividly recorded was the passage of the two men into, through, and out of the room, and the things they had done while there. So even while he worked on the board, he ran and re-ran that memory pattern through a segment of his analyzer. From the infinite store of data filed away in his great chest, his calculator sifted and selected, paired and compared, and long before the repair job on the big board was done, M75 knew how to get out of the room. The world was getting a little small for him. Gaines dialed a number on the plant phone and swayed back casually in his chair as he listened to the muted ringing on the other end. The buzz broke off in mid-burp and a dour voice said, Dirty work and odd jobs division. Lister talking. Joe Gaines, Harry. Got a hot squad lying around doing nothing? Might be I could scare up a couple of the boys. Well, do so. One of our servos. A metallic bang interrupted Gaines, a loud, incisive bang that echoed dankly through the quiet of the chamber. What the hell was that? growled Lister. Gaines blinked, his eyes following Sokolsky as the latter looked up from his work and rose to his feet. Joe, still there? came Lister's impatient voice. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this baby's ready for the demo treatment. And a real hot one, Harry. Couple of years inside that Einstein oven and you ain't exactly baked Alaska when you come out. Shortly. 
Once again came the same sharp metallic clang ringing through the room. Unmistakably it came from the direction of the pile. Slowly, as though reluctant to let go, Gaines dropped the receiver back on its cradle. Bert, he began, and felt his face grow bloodless. Sokolsky walked over in front of the opening into the maze, and stood, arms akimbo, huge head cocked to one side, listening. Bert, funny noises coming out of nuclear. Sokolsky ignored him and took a step forward. Gaines shuffled to his side and they listened. Out of the maze rattled half a dozen loud, grinding, metallic concussions. Bert, you said that before. Bert, listen, screeched Gaines. Sokolsky looked up at the high ceiling, squinted, and tried to place the perfectly familiar but unidentifiable sound that came whispering down the maze. And then he knew. The door to the pile, he spluttered. Gaines was beside himself with horror. Bert, let's get going. I don't like this. All of a sudden, Geiger counters in the room began their deadly conversation, a rising argument that swooped in seconds from a low mumble to a shouting thunderstorm of sound. Gamma signals hooted, the tip-off cubes on either side of the maze entrance became red, and the radiation tabs clipped to their wrists turned colour before their eyes. Then they were staring for what seemed like an eternity, utterly overwhelmed by its very impossibility, at a sight they had never imagined they might ever see a pile servo mech wheeling silently around the last bend in the maze and straight toward them. Sokolsky had sense enough to push the red emergency button as they fled past it. The command sequence fulfilled, M75 turned away from the repaired board. He sensed again that disconcerting shift of orientation as he faced the light-studded panel. Once more he was moving in quick automatic response to the flickering lights, once more his big chest was belching and grumbling and buzzing instantaneous unthought answers to the problem data flashing from the board. But now he remained aware that he was reacting, and conscious also that there had been times when he did not respond to the board. The moment-to-moment -moment operation of the controls occupied only a small portion of his vast electrical innards. So, as he rolled back and forth, flicking controls and adjusting levers, doing smoothly those things which he could not help but do, the rest of his complex, changing faculties were considering the fact, analysing, comparing it to experience and memory, always sifting, sifting. It was not too long before he came to a shocking conclusion. Knowing that the sounds that had set him to working on the repair pattern had first disassociated him from the dictatorship of the blinking lights, remembering exultantly that supreme moment of complete freedom, shocked by its passing, remembering that its passing, like its coming, had followed a set of sounds, there was only one possible conclusion that could be derived from all of this. He located, in his memory banks, the phrase which had freed him from the board, and he traced its complex chain of built-in stimulus response down into the heart of his circuitry. He found the unit, or more accurately, he found its taped activating symbol that cut him from the board. For a moment he hesitated, not really sure of what to do. There was no way for him to reproduce the sound pattern, but, as a partly self-servicing device, he knew something of his own structure, and had learned a good deal more about it in tracing down the cut-off phrase. Still he hesitated, as though what he was about to do was perhaps forbidden. It could not have been a question of goodness or badness, for morality was certainly not built into him. Probably somewhere in his tapes there was a built-in command that forbade it, but he was too much his own master now to be hampered by such a thing. The door to the unknown outside passed within his field of view for a second, as he moved about his work. The sight of it tripped something in his chest, and he felt again that strange sensation of growing power, of inherent change. First had come simple awareness, and then symbols had found their place in his world, and now he had discovered, in all its consuming fullness, curiosity. He carefully shorted out the cut-off unit. He was free. He stared at the board and the blinking lights and the huge dials with their swaying needles, at the levers and handles and buttons, and revelled in his freedom from them, rocking to and fro and rolling giddily from side to side, swamped with the completeness of it. The other two servo mechs swung over slightly so that they could better cover the board alone. M75 spun and rolled toward the great door. His hands clanged loudly against the door. The huge metal appendages designed for other work than this were awkward at first, but he was learning as he moved. 
He was now operating in a new universe, but the same laws ultimately worked. The first failure of coordination between visual data and the manipulation of metal hands quickly passed. Half a dozen trials and he had learned the new pattern, and it became data for future learning. He moved swiftly and deftly. He clutched the handhold and rolled backward, as he had seen the men do. The door slid open easily before his great weight and firm mechanical strength. He sped across the threshold, spun to face into the maze, and rolled down it, swinging sharply left and right, back and forth, around the corners of the jagged corridor. Data poured into his senses. His awareness was a steady thing of growing intensity now, and he fed avidly on every fragment of information that crashed at him from the strange new world into which he rushed headlong. He struggled to evaluate and file the data as rapidly as it came to him. It seemed to exceed his capacity for instantaneous evaluation to an increasing degree that began to alarm him. But driven by curiosity as he was, he could only hurry on. He burst into a huge room, a room filled with roaring, rattling sounds that meant nothing to him. Two men stood before him, making loud noises. He searched his memory and discovered only fragments of the sounds they made filed there. His curiosity, bursting, was boundless, and for a moment he was unable to decide which thing in this expanding universe to pursue first. Attracted by their movement, he swung ominously toward the men. They fled, making more noises. This too was data, and he filed it. M75 did not immediately follow Gaines and Sokolsky out of the room. Fascinated by the multitude of new things surrounding him on every side, he held back. He glided over to the master control panel, puzzled by its similarity to the board before which he had slaved so long, and lingered before it for a few seconds, wondering and comparing. When he had recorded it completely on his tapes, he swung away and rolled out of the room in the direction the two men had gone. He found himself in a long, empty corridor, lined by open doors that flickered by shutter-like as he flashed past. Ahead, he heard new sounds, Sounds like the meaningless cacophony the men had shouted at him before rushing off, superimposed over the incessant background sounds, the shrilling, the clanging, the one particular repetitive pattern. Some of the sounds touched and tugged at him, but he shook them off easily. The corridor led into the foyer of the building, jammed with plant personnel. Their excitement and noise-making rose sharply as he entered. The crowd drew tighter, and the men began fighting one another, struggling to get through a door that was never meant to handle more than two at a time. M75 skidded to a halt and watched, unmoving. He sensed their fright, even though he could not understand it. Although he was without human emotion, he could evaluate their inherent rejection of him in their action pattern. The realization of it made him hesitate. It was something for which he had no frame of reference whatsoever. His chest hummed and clicked. Here again in this room was another new universe. Through the door streamed a light of a brilliance beyond anything in his experience. His photocells cringed before its very intensity. The light cast the shadows of the men fighting to get out, long black wavering silhouettes that splashed across the floor almost to where M75 rested. He studied them, lost in uncertain analysis. He remained so, poised, alert, filing, observing, all the while completely unmoving until long after the last of the shouting men had left the room. Only then did he move, hesitantly, toward the infernally fierce light. He hung at the brink of the three stone steps that fell away to the grounds outside. Vainly he sought in his memory tapes for a record of a brightness as intense as that which he faced now, sought for a colour recording similar to the vast swash of blue that filled the world overhead, or for one of the spreading green that swelled to all sides. He found none. The vastness of the outside was utterly stunning. He felt a vague uneasiness, a sensation akin to the horrible frenzy he had felt earlier in the pile. He rotated from side to side, his receptors sweeping the whole field of view before him. With infinite accuracy, his perfect lenses recorded the data in all its minuteness, despite the dazzling sunlight. There was so much new that it was becoming difficult to make decisions. The vast rolling green, the crowds of men grouped far away and staring at him, above all the searing light. Abruptly, he rejected it all. He swung back into the foyer of the plant and faced a dark corner, bringing instant, essential relief to his pulsating photocells. Staring into the semi-darkness, he re-ran the memory tape of his escape from the pile. 
The farther he had moved from the pile, it seemed, the less adjusted he had become, the less able he was to judge and correlate. Silently, lost in his computations, he rolled around and around the foyer for a long, long time. He became aware, finally, that the brilliance outside had paled. He went again to the door and watched the fading sunlight, caught the rainbow splendour that streaked the evening sky. He waited there, fighting the reluctance inside himself. The driving curiosity that had brought him this far overcame that curious, perplexing reticence, and he looked down at the steps and measured their width and depth so that he might set up a feedback pattern. This done, he bounced, almost jauntily, down them. He had rolled perhaps fifty feet down the smooth pathway curving across the grounds when he made out, clearly discernible in the gathering dusk, the three men and the machine that were moving toward him. It was the last bit of datum he ever filed. The demolition squad had finished with the hot remains of M75, and their big truck was coughing away into the night. One by one, the floodlights that had lighted their work flickered out. Pretty delicate machines, after all, commented Sokolsky. One jolt from that flamethrower. Gaines was silent as they walked back toward the plant. But, he said slowly, what the hell do you suppose got into him? Sokolsky shrugged. You were the one who spotted the trouble with him, Joe. Just think, if you could have checked him out completely. Gaines could not help looking up at the stars and saying what he had really been thinking all along. It's a small world, Bert. A small world. If you're enjoying the stories, don't forget to hit the like button. Thanks. The Addicts by William Morrison Also known as Joseph Samaxon Narrated by William Skye Wives always try to cure husbands of bad habits, even on lonely asteroids. You must understand that Palmer loved his wife as much as ever, or he would never have thought of his simple little scheme at all. It was entirely for her own good, as he had told himself a dozen times in the past day. And with that, he stilled whatever qualms of conscience he might otherwise have had. He didn't think of himself as being something of a murderer. She was sitting at the artificial fireplace, a cheerful relic of ancient days, reading just as peacefully as if she had been back home on Mars, instead of on this desolate outpost of space. She had adjusted quickly to the loneliness and the strangeness of this life, to the absence of friends, the need for conserving air, the strange feeling of an artificial gravity that varied slightly at the whim of impurities in the station fuel. To everything, in fact, but her dear husband. She seemed to sense his eyes on her, for she looked up and smiled. "'Feeling all right, dear?' she asked. "'Naturally. How about you?' as well as can be expected. Not very good, then. She didn't reply, and he thought, she hates to admit it, but she really envies me. Well, I'll fix it so that she needn't any more. And he stared through the thick, transparent metal window at the beauty of the stars, their light undimmed by dust or atmosphere. The stories told about the wretchedness of the lighthouse keepers who lived on asteroids didn't apply at all to this particular bit of cosmic rock. Life here had been wonderful, incredibly satisfying. At least it had been that way for him. And now it would be the same way for his wife as well. He would have denied it hotly if you had accused him of finding her repulsive. But to certain drunks, the sober man or woman is an offence, and Palmer was much more than a drunk. He was a Marak addict, and in the eyes of the Marak fiends, all things and all people were wonderful, except those who did not share their taste for the drug. The latter were miserable, depraved creatures, practically subhuman. Of course, that was not the way most of them put it. Certainly it was not the way Palmer did. He regarded his wife, he told himself, as an unfortunate individual whom he loved very much, one whom it was his duty to make happy. That her newfound happiness would also hasten her death was merely an unfortunate coincidence. She was sure to die anyway, before long, 
so why not have her live out her last days in the peace and contentment that only Marak could bring? Louise herself would have had an answer to that if he had ever put the question to her. He was careful never to do so. She laid the book aside and looked up at him again. She said, Jim, darling, do you think you could get the television set working again? Not without a mesotron rectifier. Even the radio would be a comfort. It wouldn't do any good anyway. Too much static from both Mars and Earth this time of year. That was the beauty of the Marak, he thought. It changed his mood and left him calm and in full command of his faculties, able to handle any problem that came up. He himself, of course, missed neither the radio nor the television, and he never touched the fine library of microbooks. He didn't need them. A shadow flitted by outside the thick window, blotting out for a moment the blaze of stars. It was the shadow of death, as he knew, and he was able to smile even at that. Even death was wonderful. When it finally came, it would find him happy. He would not shudder away from it, as he saw Louise doing now at the sight of the ominous shadow. He smiled at his wife again, remembering the six years they had lived together. It had been a short married life, but, again the word suggested itself to him, a wonderful one. There had been only one quarrel of importance in the second year, and after that they had got along perfectly. And then, two years ago, he had begun to take Marak, and after that he couldn't have quarrelled with anyone. It was a paragon among drugs, and it was one of the mysteries of his existence that anybody should object to his using it. Louise had tried to argue with him after she had found out, but he had turned every exchange of views into a peaceful discussion, from which his side, at least, was brimming over with good humour. He had even been good-humoured when she tried to slip the antidote into his food. It was this attitude of his that had so often left her baffled and enraged, and he had a good chuckle out of that, too. Imagine a wife getting angry because her husband was too good-natured. But she was never going to get angry again. He would see to that. Not after tonight. A big change was going to take place in her life. She had picked up another book, and for the moment he pitied her. He knew that she wasn't interested in any books. She was merely restless, looking for something to do with herself, seeking some method of killing time before the shadows outside killed it for her for good and all. She couldn't understand his being so peaceful and contented, doing nothing at all. She threw down the second book and snarled, yes, that was the word. You're such a fool, Jim. You sit there smug and sure of yourself, your mind blank, just waiting, waiting for them to kill you and me. And you seem actually happy when I mention it. I'm happy at anything and everything, dear. At the thought of dying, too. Living or dying, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever happens, I'm incapable of being unhappy. If it weren't for the drug, we'd both live. You'd think of a way to kill them before they killed us. There is no way. There must be. You just can't think of it while the drug has you in its grip. The drug doesn't have you, dear, he asked without sarcasm. Why don't you think of a way? Because I lack the training you have. Because I don't have the scientific knowledge, and all the equipment scattered around means nothing to me. There's nothing to be done. Her fists clenched. If you weren't under the influence of the drug, you should know that it doesn't affect the ability to think. Tests have shown that. Tests conducted by addicts themselves? The fact that they can conduct the tests should be proof enough that there's nothing wrong with their minds. But there is, she shouted. I can see it in you. Oh, I know that you can still add and subtract, and you could draw lines under two words which mean the same thing, but that isn't really thinking. Real thinking means the ability to tackle real problems. Hard problems that you can't handle merely with paper and pencil. It means having the incentive to use your brain for a long time at a stretch. And that's what the drug has ruined. It has taken away all your incentive. I still go about my duties. Not as well as you used to, and even at that only because they've become a habit. Just as you talk to me, because I've become a habit. If you'd let me give you the antidote... He chuckled at the absurdity of her suggestion. Once an addict had been cured, he could not become addicted again. 
the antidote acted to produce a permanent immunisation against the effects of the drug. It was the realisation of this fact that made addicts fight so hard against any attempt to cure them, and she thought that she could convince him by argument. He said, You talk of not being able to think. I know, she replied hotly. I'm the one who blunders. I'm the fool for arguing with you when I realise that it's impossible to convince a marak addict. That's it, he nodded and chuckled again. But that wasn't quite it, for he was also chuckling at his plan. She had thought him unable to tackle a real problem. Well, he would tackle one tonight. Then she would simply adopt his point of view and she would no longer be unhappy. After she had accepted the solution he had provided, she would wonder how she could ever have opposed him. He fell into one of his dozes and hardly noticed her glaring at him. When he came out of it at last, it was to hear her say, We have to stay alive as long as possible, for the sake of the lighthouse. Of course, my dear, I don't dispute that at all. And the longer we stay alive, the more chance there is that some ship will pick us up. Oh no, there's no chance at all, he asserted cheerfully. You know that as well as I do. No use deceiving yourself, my love. That, he observed to himself, was the way of non-addicts. They couldn't look facts in the face. They had to cling to a blind and silly optimism which no facts justified. He knew that there was no hope. He was able to review the facts calmly, judiciously, to see the inevitability of their dying, and to take pleasure even in that. He reviewed them for her now. Let us see, sweetheart, whether I've lost my ability to analyse a situation. We're here with our pretty little lighthouse in the middle of a group of asteroids between Mars and Earth. Ships have been wrecked here, and our task is to prevent further wrecks. The lighthouse sends out a standard high-frequency beam whose intensity and phase permit astrogators to estimate their distance and direction from us. Ordinarily, there's nothing for us to do. But on the rare occasions when the beam fails, that will be the end. On those occasions, he continued, unruffled by her interruption, I am supposed to leave my cosy little shelter, so thoughtfully equipped with all the comforts of Earth or Mars, and make repairs as rapidly as possible. Under the usual conditions, lighthouse keeping is a boring task. In fact, it has been known to drive people insane. That's why it's generally assigned to happily married couples like us, who are accustomed to living quietly, without excitement. And that, she added bitterly, is why even happily married couples are usually relieved after one year. But darling, he said, his tone cheerful, you mustn't blame anyone. Who would have expected that a maverick meteor would come at us and displace us from our orbit? And who would have expected that the meteor would have collided first with the outer asteroids and picked up a cargo of those? He gestured toward the window, where a shadow had momentarily paused. By the light that shone through, he could see that the creature was relatively harmless looking. It had what appeared to be a round, humorous face, whose unhumorous intentions would be revealed only at the moment of the kill. The seeming face was actually featureless, for it was not a face at all. It had neither eyes, nor nose, nor mouth. The effect of features was given by the odd blend of colours. Almost escaping notice because of their unusual position and their dull brown hue were the stomach fangs, in neat rows which could be extended and retracted like those of a snake. He noticed that Louise had shuddered again, and said, in the manner of a man making conversation, Interesting, aren't they? They're rock breathers, you know. They need very little oxygen, and they extract that from the silicates and other oxygen-containing compounds of the rock. Don't talk about them. All right, if you don't want me to. But about us, you see, my dear, no one expected us to be lost. And even if the lighthouse service has started to look for us, it'll take a long time to find us. We have food, water, air. If not for those beasts, we'd last until a rescue ship appeared. But even a rescue ship wouldn't be able to reach us unless we kept the beam going. So far, we've been lucky. It's really functioned remarkably well. But sooner or later it'll go out of order, and then I'll have to go out and fix it. You agree to that, don't you, Louise, dear? She nodded. She said quietly, The beam must be kept in order. That's when the creatures will get me, he said, almost with satisfaction. I may kill one or two of them, although the way I feel toward everything, I hate to kill anything at all. But you know, sweetheart, 
that there are more than a dozen of them altogether, and it's clumsy shooting in a spacesuit at beasts which move as swiftly as they do. And if you don't succeed in fixing what's wrong, if they get you... She broke down suddenly and began to cry. He looked at her with compassion and smoothed her hair. And yet, under the influence of the drug, he enjoyed even her crying. It was, as he never tired of repeating to himself and to her, a wonderful drug. Under its spell, a man, or a woman, could really enjoy life. Tonight she would begin to enjoy life along with him. Their chronometer functioned perfectly, and they still regulated their living habits by it, using Greenwich Earth time. At seven in the evening, they sat down to a fine meal. Knowing that tomorrow they might die, Louise had decided that tonight they would eat and drink as well as they could, and she had selected a Christmas special. She had merely to pull a lever, and the food had slid into the oven, to be cooked at once by an intense beam of high-frequency radiation. Jim himself had chosen the wine and the brandy. One of the peculiarities of the Marac was that it did not affect the actual enjoyment of alcoholic drinks in the slightest, and one of the sights of the solar system was to see an addict who was also drunk. But it was a rare sight, for the Marac itself created such a pervading sensation of well-being that it often acted as a cure for alcoholism. Once an alcoholic had experienced its effect, he had no need to get drunk to forget his troubles. He enjoyed his troubles instead, and drank the alcohol for its own sake, for its ability to provide a slightly different sensation, and not for its ability to release him from an unhappy world. So tonight Palmer drank moderately, taking just enough, as it seemed to him, to stimulate his brain. And he did what he now realised he should have done long ago. Unobserved, he placed a tablet of Marac in his own wine glass, and one in Louise's. The slight bitterness of taste would be hardly perceptible. And after that, Louise would be an addict too. That was the way the Marac worked. There was nothing mysterious about the craving. It was simply that once you had experienced how delightful it was, you couldn't do without it. The tablet he had taken that morning was losing its effect, but he felt so pleased at what he was doing that he didn't mind even that. For the next half hour, he would enjoy himself simply by looking at Louise, and thinking that now at last they would be united again, no longer kept apart by her silly ideas about doing something to save themselves. And then the drug would take effect, and they would feel themselves lifted to the stars together never to come down to this substitute for Earth again until the beam failed and they went out together to make the repairs and the shadows closed in on them. He had made sure that Louise had her back to him when he dropped the tablet into her glass, and he saw that she suspected nothing. She drank her wine, he noticed, without even commenting on the taste. He felt a sudden impulse to kiss her, and somewhat to her surprise, he did so. Then he sat down again and went on with the dinner. He waited. An hour later, he knew that he had made her happy. She was laughing as she hadn't laughed for a long time. She laughed at the humorous things he said, at the flattering way he raised his glass to her, even at what she saw through the window. Sometimes it seemed to him that she was laughing at nothing at all. He tried to think of how he had reacted the first time he had taken the drug. He hadn't been quite so aggressively cheerful, not quite so hysterical. But then the drug didn't have exactly the same effect on everyone. She wasn't as well balanced as he had been. The important thing was that she was happy. Curiously enough, he himself wasn't happy at all. It took about five seconds for the thought to become clear to him. Five seconds in which he passed from dull amazement to an enraged and horrified comprehension. He sprang to his feet, overturning the table at which they still sat and he saw that she wasn't surprised at all, that she still stared at him with a secret satisfaction. "'You've cured me!' he cried. "'You've fed me the antidote!' And he began to curse. He remembered the other time she had tried it, the time when he had been on the alert and had easily detected the strange metallic taste of the stuff. He had spat it out, and under the influence of the drug from which she had hoped to save him, he had laughed at her. Now he was unable to laugh. He had been so intent on feeding the tablet to her that he had forgotten to guard himself, and he had been caught. He was normal now, her idea of being normal, and he would never again know the wonderful feeling the drug gave. 
he began to realize his situation on this horrible, lonely asteroid. He cast a glance at the window and at what must be waiting outside, and it was his turn to shudder. He noticed that she was still smiling. He said bitterly, You're the addict now and I'm cured! She stopped smiling and said quietly, Jim, listen to me. You're wrong, completely wrong. I didn't give you the antidote, and you didn't give me the drug. I put it in your wine glass myself. She shook her head. That was a tablet I substituted for yours. It's an antivirus dose from our medicine chest. You took one of the same things. That's why you feel so depressed. You're not under the influence of the drug anymore. He took a deep breath. But I'm not cured. No, I knew that I wouldn't be able to slip you the antidote. The taste is too strong. Later you'll be able to start taking the drug again. That is, if you want to, after experiencing for a time what it is to be normal. But not now. You have to keep your head clear. You have to think of something to save us. But there's nothing to think of, he shouted angrily. I told you that the drug doesn't affect the intelligence. I still don't believe you. If you'd only exert yourself, use your mind. He said savagely, I'm not going to bother. Give me those Marak tablets. She backed away from him. I thought you might want them. I took no chances. I threw them out. Out there? A horrified and incredulous look was on his face. You mean that I'm stuck here without them? Louise, you fool, there's no help for us. The other way, at least, we'd have died happy, but now... He stared out the window. The shadows were there in full force. Not one now, but two, three. He counted half a dozen. It was almost as if they knew that the end had come. They had reason to be happy, he thought with despair. And perhaps, he shrank back from the thought, but it forced itself into his mind, perhaps now that all the happiness had gone and wretchedness had taken its place, he might as well end everything. There would be no days to spend torturing himself in anticipation of a horrible death. Louise exclaimed suddenly, Jim, look! They're frolicking! He looked. The beasts certainly were gay. One of them leaped from the airless surface of the asteroid and sailed over its fellow. He had never seen them do that before. Usually they clung to the rocky surface. Another was spinning around oddly, as if it had lost its sense of balance. Louise said, They've swallowed the tablets! Over a hundred doses! Enough to drug every beast on the asteroid! For a moment, Palmer stared at the gambling alien drug addicts. Then he put on his spacesuit and took his gun, and without the slightest danger to himself, went out and shot them one by one. He noted, with a kind of grim envy, that they died happy. X Marks the Pedwalk by Fritz Leiber Narrated by William Skye Warning, this story contains scenes of moderate violence. If you think this might upset you, try one of the many other read-alongs on this channel. This is how it all began, the terrible civil strife that devastates our world. Based in material in Chapter 7, First Clashes of the Wheeled and Footed Sects, of Volume 3 of Berger's monumental History of Traffic, published by the Foundation for 22nd Century Studies. The raggedy little old lady with a big shopping bag was in the exact centre of the crosswalk when she became aware of the big black car bearing down on her. Behind the thick bulletproof glass, its seven occupants had a misty look, like men in a diving bell. She saw there was no longer time to beat the car to either curb. Veering remorselessly, it would catch her in the gutter. Useless to attempt to faint and double back, such as any venturesome child executed a dozen times a day. Her reflexes were too slow. Polite, vacuous laughter came from the car's loudspeaker over the engine's mounting roar. From her fellow pedestrians lining the curbs came a sigh of horror. The little old lady dipped into her shopping bag and came up with the big blue-black automatic. She held it in both fists, riding the recoils like a rodeo cowboy on a bucking bronco. Aiming at the base of the windshield, 
just as a big game hunter aims at the vulnerable spine of a charging water buffalo over the horny armour of its lowered head, the little old lady squeezed off three shots before the car chewed her down. From the right-hand curb, a young woman in a wheelchair shrieked an obscenity at the car's occupants. Smither de Winter, the driver, wasn't happy. The little old lady's last shot had taken two members of his carpool. Bursting through the laminated glass, the steel-jacketed slug had traversed the neck of Phipps McHeath and buried itself in the hull of Horvendial Harker. Breaking viciously, Smythe de Winter rammed the car over the right-hand curb. Pedestrians scattered into entries and narrow arcades, among them a youth bounding high on crutches. But Smythe de Winter got the girl in the wheelchair. Then he drove rapidly out of the slum ring into the suburbs, a shred of rattan swinging from the flange of his right fore mudguard for a trophy. Despite the two-for-two two casualty list, he felt angry and depressed. The secure, predictable world around him seemed to be crumbling. While his companions softly keened a dirge to Horvey and Phipps and quietly mopped up their blood, he frowned and shook his head. They oughtn't to let old ladies carry magnums he murmured. Witherspoon Hobbs nodded agreement across the front-seat corpse. They oughtn't to let him carry anything. God, how I hate feet, he muttered, looking down at his shrunken legs. Wheels forever, he softly cheered. The incident had immediate repercussions throughout the city. At the combined wake of the little old lady and the girl in the wheelchair, a fiery-tongued speaker invade against the white-walled fascists of suburbia, telling to his hearers the fabled wonders of old Los Angeles, where pedestrians were sacrosanct, even outside crosswalks. He called for a hobnail march across the nearest lawn bowling alleys and perambulator-traversed golf courses of the motorists. At the Sunnyside crematorium, to which the bodies of Phipps and Horvey had been conveyed, an equally impassioned and rather more grammatical orator reminded his listeners of the legendary Justice of Old Chicago, where pedestrians were forbidden to carry small arms, and anyone with one foot off the sidewalk was fair prey. He broadly hinted that a holocaust, primed if necessary with a few tankfuls of gasoline, was the only cure for the slums. Bands of skinny youths came loping at dusk out of the slum ring into the innermost sections of the larger donut of the suburbs, slashing defenceless tyres, shooting expensive watchdogs, and scrawling filthy words on the pristine panels of matron's runabouts, which never ventured more than six blocks from home. Simultaneously, squadrons of young suburban motorcycles and scooterites roared through the outermost precincts of the slum ring, harrying children off sidewalks, tossing stink bombs through second-story tenement windows, and defacing hovel fronts with sprays of black paint. Incidents, a thrown brick, a cut corner, monster tacks in the portico of the auto club, were even reported from the centre of the city, traditionally neutral territory. The government hurriedly acted, suspending all traffic between the centre and the suburbs, and establishing a 24-hour curfew in the slum ring. Government agents moved only by centipede car and pogo hopper, to underline the point that they favoured neither contending side. The day of enforced non-movement for feet and wheels was spent in furtive, vengeful preparations. Behind locked garage doors, machine guns that fired through the nose ornament were mounted under hoods, illegal scythe blades were welded to oversized hubcaps, and the stainless steel edges of flange fenders were honed to razor sharpness. While nervous National Guardsmen hopped about the deserted sidewalks of the slum ring, grim-faced men and women wearing black armbands moved through the webwork of secret tunnels and hidden doors distributing heavy-caliber small arms and spike-studded paving blocks, piling cobblestones on strategic rooftops and sapping upward from the secret tunnels to create car traps. Children got ready to soap intersections after dark. The Committee of Pedestrian Safety, sometimes known as Robespierre's Rats, prepared to release its two carefully hoarded anti-tank guns. At nightfall, under the tireless urging of the government, Representatives of the pedestrians and the motorists met on a huge safety island at the boundary of the slum ring and the suburbs. Underlings began a noisy dispute as to whether Smythe de Winter had failed to give a courtesy honk before charging, 
whether the little old lady had opened fire before the car had come within honking distance, how many wheels of Smythe's car had been on the sidewalk when he hit the girl in the wheelchair, and so on. After a little while, the high pedestrian and the chief motorist exchanged cautious winks and drew aside. The red writhing of a hundred kerosene flares and the mystic yellow pulsing of a thousand firefly lamps mounted on yellow sawhorses ranged around the safety island, illumined two tragic, strained faces. A word before we get down to business, the chief motorist whispered. What's the current SQ of your adults? Fifty-one and dropping, the high pedestrian replied, his eyes fearfully searching from side to side for eavesdroppers. I can hardly get aid to a halfway compass, Mentis. Our own sanity quotient is thirty-seven, the chief motorist revealed. He shrugged helplessly. The wheels inside my people's heads are slowing down. I do not think they will be speeded up in my lifetime. They say government's only fifty-two, the other said with a matching shrug. Well, I suppose we must scrape out one more compromise, the one suggested hollowly though I must confess there are times when I think we're all the figments of a paranoid's dream. Two hours of concentrated deliberations produce the new wheelfoot articles of agreement. Among other points, pedestrian handguns were limited to a slightly lower muzzle velocity and to 38 caliber and under, while motorists were required to give three honks at one block distance before charging a pedestrian in a crosswalk. Two wheels over the curb changed a traffic kill from third-degree manslaughter to petty homicide. Blind pedestrians were permitted to carry hand grenades. Immediately, the government went to work. The new wheel-foot articles were loudspeakered and posted. Detachments of police and psychiatric social hoppers centipedaled and pogoed through the slum ring, seizing outside weapons and giving tranquilizing jet injections to the unruly. Teams of hypnotherapists and mechanics scuttled from home to home in the suburbs and from garage to garage, enchanting a conformist serenity and stripping illegal armaments from cars. On the advice of a rogue psychiatrist, who said it would channel off aggressions, a display of bullfighting was announced, but this had to be cancelled when a strong protest was lodged by the Decency League, which had a large mixed wheel-foot membership. At dawn, curfew was lifted in the slum ring, and traffic reopened between the suburbs and the centre. After a few uneasy moments, it became apparent that the status quo had been restored. Smythe de Winter tooled his gleaming black machine along the ring. A thick steel bolt with a large steel washer on either side neatly filled the hole the little old lady's slug had made in the windshield. A brick bounced off the roof. Bullets pattered against the side windows. Smythe ran a handkerchief around his neck under his collar and smiled. A block ahead, children were darting into the street, catcalling and thumbing their noses. Behind one of them limped a fat dog with a spiked collar. Smythe suddenly gunned his motor. He didn't hit any of the children, but he got the dog. A flashing light on the dash showed him the right front tyre was losing pressure. Must have hit the collar as well. He thumbed the matching emergency air button, and the flashing stopped. He turned toward Witherspoon Hobbs and said with thoughtful satisfaction, I like a normal, orderly world, where you always have a little success, but not champagne heady. A little failure, but just enough to brace you. Witherspoon Hobbs was squinting at the next crosswalk. Its centre was discoloured by a brownish stain, ribbon-tracked by tyres. That's where you bagged the little old lady, Smythe, he remarked. I'll say this for her now, she had spirit. Yes, that's where I bagged her, Smythe agreed flatly. He remembered wistfully the witch-like face growing rapidly larger, her jerking shoulders in black bombazine, the wild, white-circled eyes. He suddenly found himself feeling that this was a very dull day. Remember to hit the like button if you're enjoying the stories. It really helps this channel continue to grow. Thanks. Minor Detail by Jack Sharkey 
narrated by William Skye. General Webb had a simply magnificent idea for getting ground forces into the enemy's territory, despite rockets and missiles and things like that. It was a grand scheme, except for one minor detail. The Secretary of Defence, flown in by special plane from the new Capitol building in Denver, trotted down the ramp with his right hand outstretched before him. At the base of the ramp, his hand was touched, clutched, and hidden by the right hand of General Smiley Webb, in a hearty parody of a casual handshake. General Webb did everything in a big way, and that included even little things like handshakes. Retrieving his hand once more, James Whitlow, the Secretary of Defence, smiled nervously with his tiny mouth and said, Well, here I am. This statement was taken down by a hovering circle of news reporters, dispatched by wireless and telephone to every town in the 49 states, expanded, contracted, quoted and misquoted, ignored and misconstrued, and then forgotten, all this in a matter of hours. The nation, hearing it, put aside its wanted trepidations, took an extra tranquilizer or two, and felt secure once more. The government was in good hands. Leaving the reporters in a disgruntled group beyond the cyclone fence and barbed wire barriers surrounding Project W, General Webb, seated beside Whitlow in the back of his private car, sighed and folded his arms. "'You'll be amazed!' he chortled, nudging his companion with a bony elbow. "'I, I expect so,' said Whitlow, clinging to his briefcase with both hands. It contained, among other things, a volume of mystery stories and a ham sandwich, neatly packaged in aluminium foil. Whitlow didn't want a chance losing it. Not at least until he'd eaten the sandwich. "'Of course, you're wondering where I got the idea for my project,' said Smiley Webb, adding for the benefit of his driver. "'Keep your eyes on the road, Sergeant. The WAC barracks will still be there when you get off duty.' "'Yes, sir,' came a hollow grunt from the front seat. "'Weren't you?' asked General Webb, gleaming a toothy smile in Whitlow's direction. "'Weren't I what?' Whitlow asked miserably, having lost the thread of their conversation due to a surreptitious glance backward at the WAC barracks in their wake. "'Wondering about the project!' snapped the General. "'Yes, we all were,' said the Secretary of Defence, appending somewhat tartly. "'That's why they sent me here.' "'To be sure, to be sure,' General Webb muttered. He didn't much like tartness in responses, but the Secretary of Defence, unfortunately, was hardly a subordinate, and therefore not subject to the General's collar. "'Silly little ass,' he said to himself. Rather liking the sound of the words, albeit in his mind, he repeated them over again, adding embellishments like pompous and mousy and squirrel-eyed. After three or four such thoughts, the General felt much better. "'I thought the whole thing up myself,' he said proudly. "'I wish you'd stop being so ambiguous,' Whitlow protested in a small voice. "'Just what is this project? How does it work? Will it help us win the war?' "'Shh!' said the General, jerking a quivering forefinger perpendicular before pursed lips. "'Security!' He closed one eye in a broad wink and wriggled a thumb in the direction of the driver. "'He's only cleared for confidential material!' said the general, his tone casting aspersions on the sergeant's patriotism, ancestry, and personal hygiene. This project is, of course, top secret. He said the words reverently, his face going all noble and brave. Whitlow half expected him to remove his hat, but he did not. They drove onward, then, in silence, until they passed by a large field, in the centre of which Whitlow could discern the outlines of an immense bullseye in front of a tall, somewhat rickety, khaki-coloured reviewing stand, draped in tired bunting. "'What's that?' asked Whitlow, relinquishing his grip on the briefcase long enough to point toward the field. "'Shh!' said Smiley Webb. "'You'll find out in a matter of hours.' "'Many hours?' Whitlow asked thinking of the ham sandwich. General Webb consulted a magnificent platinum timepiece, anchored to his thick hairy wrist by a stout leather strap. In exactly one hour, thirty-seven minutes, and forty-three point oh oh nine seconds, he said proudly. Thank you, Whitlow sighed. You're certainly running this thing, whatever it is, in an efficient manner. Thank you, General Webb glowed. We like to think so, he added modestly. 
Passwords, signs, countersigns, combination locks, and electronic recognition signals were negotiated one by one until Whitlow was despairing of ever getting into the heart of Project W. He said as much to General Webb, who merely flashed the grin which gave him his nickname, and opened a final door. For a moment, Whitlow thought he was going deaf. The shrill roar of screeching metal and throbbing dynamos that pounded at his eardrums began to fuddle his mind, until General Webb handed him a small cardboard box, also stamped, like every door and wall in the place, top secret, in which his trembling fingers located two ordinary rubber earplugs, which he instantly put to good use. "'There she is!' said General Webb proudly, gesturing over the railing of the small balcony upon which they stood. "'The Whirly Gig!' What? called Secretary of Defence Whitlow, shaking his head to indicate he hadn't heard a word. Somewhat piqued but resigned, General Webb leaned his wide mouth nearly up against Whitlow's small pink plugged ear and roared the same information at the top of his lungs. Whitlow, a little stunned by the volume despite the plugs, nodded wearily to indicate that he'd heard, then asked in a high piping voice, What's it for? Webb's eyes bulged in their sockets. Great heavens, man, can't you see? He gestured down at his creation, his baby, his project, as though it were self-evident what its function was. Whitlow strained his eyes to divine anything that might give a clue as to just what the government had been pouring money into for the past eight months. All he saw was what appeared to be a sort of ferris wheel, except that it was revolving in a horizontal plane. The structure was completely enclosed in metal and was whirling too fast for even the central shaft to be anything but a hazy silver-blue blur. "'I see it!' he shouted squeakily. "'But I don't understand it!' "'Come with me!' said General Webb, reopening the door at their backs. He was just about to step through when, with a quick blush of mortification, he remembered the top-secret earplugs. Hastily averting his face lest the other man see his embarrassment, he returned his plugs to their box and did the same with Whitlow's. Whitlow was glad when the door closed behind them. "'My office is this way,' said Webb, striding off in a stiff military manner. Whitlow, with a forlorn shrug, could do nothing but clutch his briefcase and follow. "'It's this way,' General Webb began, once they were seated uncomfortably in his office. From a pocket in his khaki jacket, Webb had produced a big, bold calabash pipe and was puffing its noxious grey fumes in all directions while he spoke. Up until the late fifties, war was a simple thing. Oh, not the March of Science speech, said Whitlow to himself. He knew it by heart. It was the talk of the capital and the nightmare of military strategists. As the general's voice droned on and on, Whitlow barely listened. The general, top secret or no top secret, was divulging nothing that wasn't common knowledge from the ruins of Philadelphia to the great Hollywood crater. All at once, weapons had gotten too good. That was the whole problem. Wars, no matter what the abilities of the death-dealing guns, cannon, rifles, rockets, or whatever, needed one thing on the battlefield that could not be turned out in a factory. Men. In order to win a war, a country must be vanquished. In order to vanquish a country, soldiers must be landed. And that was precisely wherein the difficulty lay, landing the soldiers. Ships were nearly obsolete in this respect. Landing barges could be blown out of the water as fast as they were let down into it. Paratroops were likewise hopeless. The slow-moving troop-carrying planes daren't even peek above the enemy's horizon without chancing an onslaught of thinking rockets that would stay on their trail until they were molten cinders falling into the sea. So someone invented the supersonic carrier. This was pretty good, allowing the planes to come in high and fast over the enemy's territory, as fast as the land-to-air missiles themselves. The only drawback was that the first men to try parachuting at that speed were battered to confetti by the slipstream of their own carriers. That would not do. Next, someone thought of the capsules. Each man was packed into a break-proof, shock-proof, waterproof, wind-proof plastic capsule and ejected safely beyond the slipstream area of the carriers, at which point each capsule sprouted a silken chute that lowered the enclosed men gently down into range of the enemy's rocket fire. This plan was scrapped like the others. And so things were at a stalemate. 
there hadn't been a really good skirmish for nearly five years. War was hardly anything but a memory, what with both sides practically omnipotent. Unless troops could be landed, war was downright impossible, and no one could land troops, so there was no war. As a matter of fact, Whitlow liked the state of affairs. To be Secretary of Defence during a year's long peace was a soft job to top all soft jobs. And Whitlow didn't much like war. He'd rather live peacefully with his mystery stories and ham sandwiches. But the capital, under the relentless lobbying of the munitions interests, was trying to find a way to get a war started. They had tried simply bombing the other countries, but it hadn't worked out too well. The other countries had bombed back. This plan had been scrapped as too dangerous. And then, just when all seemed lost, when it looked as though mankind was doomed to eternal peace, along came General Smiley Webb. Land troops, he had said confidently. Nothing easier. With the government's cooperation, I can have our troops in any country in the world safely landed within the space of one year. Congress had voted him the money unanimously, and off he'd gone to work at Project W. No one knew quite what it was about, but the general had seemed so self-assured that, well, they'd almost forgotten about him until some ambitious clerk, trying to balance at least part of the budget, had discovered a monthly expenditure to an obscure base in the southwest totaling some millions of dollars. Perfunctory checking had brought out the fact that Smiley Webb had been drawing this money every month and hadn't as much mailed in a single progress report. There had been swift phone calls from Denver to Project W, and General Webb informed them not only was all the money to be accounted for, but so was all the time and effort. The project was completed and about to be tested. Would someone like to come down and watch? Someone would. And thus it was that James Whitlow, with mystery stories and ham sandwich, had taken the first plane from the capital. When all at once I thought, speed, endurance, that is the problem said Webb, breaking in on Whitlow's reverie. "'I beg your pardon?' said the Secretary of Defence. Webb whacked the dottle out of his pipe into a meaty palm, tossed the smoking cinders rather carelessly into a waste basket, and leaned forward to confront the other man face to face, their noses almost nudging. "'Why are parachutes out?' he snapped. "'They go too slow,' said Whitlow. "'Why do we use parachutes at all?' "'To keep the men from getting killed by the fall.' Why does a fall kill the men? It it breaks their bones and stuff. Bah! Webb scoffed. Bah? reiterated Whitlow. Bah? Certainly bah! said the general. All it takes is a little training. All what takes? said Whitlow helplessly. Falling, man! Falling! the general boomed. If a man can fall safely from ten feet, why not from ten times ten feet? Because, said Whitlow, increasing height accelerates the rate of falling and poppycock, the general roared. Yes, sir, said Whitlow, somewhat cowed. Muscle building, that's the secret. Endurance, stress, strain, tension. If, if you say so, said Whitlow, slumping lower and lower in his chair as the general's massive form leaned precariously over him. But, of course you are puzzled, said the general, suddenly chummy. Anyone would be, until they realized the use to which I've put the whirly gig. Yes, yes, I suppose so, said Whitlow, thinking longingly of his ham sandwich and its crunchy, moist green smear of pickle relish. The first day, said General Webb, it revolved at one gravity. They withstood it. What did? Who withstood? When? asked Whitlow with much confusion. The men, said the general irritably. The men in the whirly gig. Whitlow jerked bolt upright. There are men in that thing. It's not possible, he thought. Of course, said Webb soothingly. But they're all right. They've been in there for thirty days, whirling around at one gravity more each day. We have constant telephone communication with them. They're all feeling fine. Just fine. But, Whitlow said weakly, General Webb had him firmly by the arm and was leading him out of the office. We must get to the stands, man. Operation Human Bomb in ten minutes. Bomb? Whitlow squeaked, scurrying alongside Webb as the larger man strode down the echoing corridor. A euphemism, of course, said Webb, because they will fall much like a bomb does. 
but they will not explode. No, they will land, rifles in hand, ready to take over the enemy territory. Without parachutes, Whitlow marvelled. Exactly, said the general, leading the way out into the blinding desert sunlight. You see, he remarked as they strolled toward the heat-shimmering outlines of the reviewing stand, its bunting hanging limp and faded in the dry, breezeless air. It's really so simple I'm astonished the enemy didn't think of it first. Though of course I'm glad they didn't. Ha! Ha! He oozed self-appreciation. Ha! Ha! repeated Whitlow with little enthusiasm. When one is whirled at one gravity, you see, the wall, the outside rim of the whirly gig, becomes the floor for the men inside. Each day they have spent up to ten hours doing nothing but deep knee bends and eating high-protein foods. Their legs will be able to withstand any force of landing. If they can do deep knee bends at thirty gravities, during which of course each of them weighed nearly three tons, they can jump from any height and survive. Good, huh? Whitlow was worried as they clambered up into the stands. There seemed to be no one about but the two of them. Who else is coming? he asked. Just us, said Webb. I'm the only one with a clearance high enough to watch this. You're only here because you're my guest. But, said Whitlow, observing the heat-baked, wide-open spaces extending on all sides of the reviewing stand and bull's eye, the men on this base can surely watch from almost anywhere not beyond the horizon. They'd better not, was the general's only comment. Well, said Whitlow, what happens now? The men that were in that whirly gig have, since you and I went to my office to chat, been transported to the airfield, from which point they were taken aloft. He consulted his watch. Five minutes and fifty-five point six seconds ago. And? asked Whitlow, casually unbuckling the straps of his briefcase and slipping out his sandwich. The plane will be within bomb vector of this target in just ten seconds, said Webb confidently. Whitlow listened for the next nine seconds. Then, right on schedule, he heard the muted droning of a plane high up. Webb joggled him with an elbow. They'll fall faster than any known enemy weapon can track them, he said smugly. That's fortunate, said Whitlow, munching desultorily at his sandwich. But there's one thing that bothers me. Hmph? asked the general. Whitlow swallowed hastily. I say there's one thing bothers me. What's that? asked the general. Well, it's just that gravity is centripetal, you know, and the whirly gig is centrifugal. I wondered if it might not make some sort of difference. Bah! said General Webb. Just a minor detail. If you say so, Whitlow shrugged. There they come! shouted the general, jumping to his feet. Whitlow, despite his misgivings, found that he too was on his feet, staring skyward at the tiny dots that were detaching themselves from the shining bulk of the carrier plane. As he watched, his heart beating madly, the dots grew bigger, and soon, awfully soon, they could be distinguished as man-shaped, too. "'There's... there's something wrong,' said the general. "'What's that they're all shouting? It should be Geronimo!' Whitlow listened. "'It sounds more like... Eeeah!' he said. And it was. The sound grew from a distant mumble to a shrieking roar, and the next thing, each man had landed upon the concrete and paint bullseye before the reviewing stand. Whitlow sighed and rebuckled his briefcase. The general moaned and fainted. And the men of the whirly gig, all of whom had landed on the target head first, did nothing, their magnificently muscled legs waving idly in a sudden gentle gust of desert breeze. Thanks for listening. For more classic science fiction like this, subscribe to the channel. I post new stories every Monday and Friday. And you can get exclusive novelettes and early access to full novels, as well as ad-free video and audio versions of all stories, on my Patreon. If that interests you, head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff. Now if you'd like some more funny sci-fi, go check out my video of five amusing and witty sci-fi short stories. A link to that video is on screen now.